Hey everybody, Vince here from the Gallatin Underground doing a Hidden Gems episode with my co-host. I'm Chris and we have uh, Taylor Gallagher with us to talk about art that is metal and metal that is art. <laughs> Taylor, how's it going? Great, how are you guys? We're doing great. So your company is called Periphery Metalworks, is that correct? It is. Cool. <laughs> um, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay, so uh, I started Periphery Metalworks about five years ago. And um, I started out before I was doing metal work. I was doing a lot of um, like fine cooking and I really liked the aesthetic part of it and I didn't really like the impermanence of it. So I wanted to start creating things that stuck around a little bit longer. And so I decided- Something that could maybe stand the test of time? Yes, exactly. So I decided to get into metal working as a medium kind of because of that um, and then transitioned into uh, doing a lot of machining and then um, started my own company making jewelry and um, like sculptural art pieces. That's really cool. Thanks. So how did you get started in, in working with metal? I, I mean, you said you started off as a fine cook, which is an art in itself, but that's kind of a huge transition from going from something that you can eat to something that lasts forever. Totally. Um, so I used to work up at the Yellowstone Club as a cook, and on my way to Big Sky every day, I would drive past this metal shop in Gateway and just said metal art, and it just looked like a really cool building, and I would kind of daydream about working in a place like that someday. And then um, one day towards the end of one of the seasons up at the club, um, a friend got a hold of me and said that there was a job opening um, at the shop that he worked at for a machinist. And it was an entry-level position and just to come and check it out. And I pulled up to the interview and it was in that building. And I thought that that was really cool. And no I just shit. took just, the job on the spot. You're, so the place that you drove by thinking about every day happened to be the place that had an opening and, and you just went for it. Yeah, exactly. So, it was uh, Ridgeline Metal Arts, wasn't it? What was that? Was it Ridgeline uh, uh, Metal Arts? Big Sky Metal Art out in Gallatin Gateway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a place called Ridgeline, I think, out in Gateway. It was kind of like off to the left on your way up the canyon. Totally, yeah. Like the, with the little white house and everything, and they did a lot of metal work, too. Yeah. With so, the big gear or something. Yeah, so the one with the gear, that is Big Sky Metal Art. Oh, it is, okay. Yeah, so that's the shop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I remember I started, that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I started working um, for the machining company, um, machining parts for camera equipment. So it was a lot of, like, handheld camera stabilizers and things like that. So um, three axis, like vertical aluminum machining and then anodizing, which is like a, a finished process for aluminum and titanium. Um, but yeah, so I started doing that and then I started machining for a few more companies and then I started doing steel fabrication full time. But then um, during the process of that, I kind of started honing in my, my methods for my art and my jewelry on the side. That's that's really cool. So with metal, there's well, metal is such a strange thing, right? I mean, there's so many different types of metal and none of it quite reacts the same as the other. Is that correct? Yeah, that's totally correct. And it's very versatile in the sense that there's a ton of different applications for every different type of metal and all the properties of the different metals and how they can be used. So um, that was one of the reasons that I chose it as well, because of the versatility and because I know that I get bored with things kind of easily, so um, I knew that there were a lot of other avenues to pursue like within that field in general if I get bored and want to switch to something else down the line. So you, you kind of looked at it as there's there's a million options for me to not get bored at this craft that I might pursue. Exactly. That's cool. That's really cool. Thanks. Um, so you, you mentioned that there's several different types of, of methods that you would use to try to create your jewelry. Does that make it difficult for you to work with certain metals with other metals? Um, do you mean like combining different metals together or? Well, I guess I, I really don't know. I, I don't work metal myself, but I would assume, yeah, like it, it, can you like swirl a piece of silver and aluminum and gold together? I, I, I don't know. Um, you can plate different metals on top of each other, but I usually prefer to start with organic materials um, for my plating and then plate a metal on top of an organic material. But you can 
you can definitely mix a lot of different types of metal together if you want to. They just, you have to know how they all react with each other. Was it something that was really hard for you to, to grasp at first or did it just kind of come natural? Um, you kind of just have to focus on one at a time and focus on the different properties of the different materials that you're using. Um, and then once you figure out how one works, it helps you get a better understanding of how the ones, the other ones work. Well, that's cool. Um, when, when you're working with metal, is it something that you have to just pick something right off the bat? I guess, I guess when you got started, you kind of jumped into a position where you're where it was your job and so you were forced to do something that maybe or maybe did or didn't interest you um where where did you go where where did when did you decide that you were going to make it art instead of your day job i guess i've always wanted to do both um i've always wanted to learn a more industrial type of metalworking um to fund my less industrial more artistic um types of metalworking so i've always wanted to be able to um, fabricate, but I've always also wanted to be able to work with jewelry and work with metals that aren't traditionally used in industrial purposes. So it's nice to be able to do both, I guess. That That's kind of the best of both worlds, I guess, where you're, you enjoy what you do for the day job, but you also still can take it home and, and do something in, incredibly different in the same scope of work when, exactly. when you're off. And I would love to be able to combine those two um, into one field towards like the middle of my career. So I'm currently working on trying to create like artistic fabrication pieces that I can do full time. So I'm um, trying to start a foundry at the moment and trying to get shop space and um, trying to expand all of my like kind of extracurricular passions and trying to make them into something that can be more cohesive and used as in more of like the fabrication realm. Um, so it's going to be cool to see how everything kind of pulls together and combines. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky thing when you're just starting from nothing, but you're, you know, it seems like you have a lot of ambition and, and you've been pushing for this for several years and you kind of have a vision in mind. Um, in, in the Gallatin Valley here, has it been hard for you to pursue this ambition with, the the growth and uh, the competition in the area um not necessarily it was hard for me to get a start as a welder so i ended up going to the gallatin college uh welding program because i couldn't find anybody that would hire me without prior experience that was my main challenge getting into the field um but ever since then it's been quite easy for me to get work and um be able to keep myself plenty busy and you you must be fairly talented in your day job as well as with your art. Uh, otherwise, it might be a little bit more difficult to to have that sort of availability or uh, posterity in, in your position. Um, yeah, so I definitely love steel fabrication, and I definitely want to keep honing in those skills and advancing with that as well. Um, so it, it is kind of difficult sometimes to be able to put the necessary amount of focus into both at the same time. I definitely struggle with that. But um, other than that, I very much enjoy what I do and I feel like it's very well-rounded and yeah. That's super cool. Let's, let's talk about some of the pieces that you got. So the, the first one that we got up there is a, a jawbone and is it actually a jaw, a jaw, a real jawbone? It is. So it's electroplated and copper. Um, so it's a deer jawbone that I found and then cleaned and then sealed and then um, used the electroplating process to plate copper on top of the existing object. So, I mean, I'm looking at it on, on the screen here right now and it, 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 it looks like it's entirely coated in copper. I, I mean, I don't understand electroplating at all. I, I, I'm a novice. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how metal works, especially with organic materials, but it's got to be very tricky to get it to bind like that to something, isn't it? Yeah, so um, electroplating isn't a very common um, practice with organic materials specifically. That's definitely um, an art application that isn't super commonly used. 
a lot of people use it for jewelry, but um, I'm trying to advance it to be able to do like full uh, head mounts for hunters and things like that. So I'm trying to expand my skills with the electroplating with organic materials. But the basic um, concept of electroplating with copper specifically is you take your organic material and um, you use an electrolytic solution to plate copper onto that material. And um, because you're using sulfuric acid, you have to seal anything that's organic. So because that's an organic material, you have to seal it with lacquer so the acid doesn't eat it. And then after you do that, you spray the material with something that's conductive. So um, they make specific conductive paints that you can use for plating, but uh, I've also noticed that you can buy like a $4 can of graphite spray lubricant at Home Depot, and that's what I use. Um, so I just spray graphite lubricant onto the piece after it's been sealed, and then you take a power rectifier, and then you basically create a battery um, in the electrolytic solution, which is sulfuric acid, copper sulfate, distilled water, um, and like a brightening solution. And you suspend the piece that you're trying to plate in the center of the tank, and then you place pieces of copper on the outside of the tank and you run a positive charge through your anode pieces on the side and then you run your ground through your piece that you want to plate. And um, by creating that electrical current, the acid in the tank dissolves the copper on the outsides of the tank and it forms it on top of what you're trying to plate in the center. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a really cool process. I love it science <laughs> i know I, i'm like blown away right now i'm just like you're you're turning rock into metal that's really awesome <laughs> thanks yeah i love it it's super cool it's only like a millimeter thick it's really thin but it but, but your finished I mean, product looks amazing thank you oh yeah no it's it's super cool we'll look at it again there yeah it, it just I, the way that it binds to it i mean it looks like it covers every little cavity inside of that jawbone i'm yeah. Um, I think it comes out really beautiful, and I'm really excited to see what I can turn that into uh, for future products. Have you tried to do a, a full mount yet, like a, 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 a like a, a European mount? Yeah, so uh, this spring I tried to play an antelope skull, and it worked pretty well, but there's this little crevice in between um, the horn bases where there's like a little dip, and it didn't quite plate there and it started to crack. So I pulled it out of the tank and I haven't really messed with it for a while, but I think pretty soon here, now that things are starting to slow down a little bit for me, I'm gonna get some time to get my uh, tank up and running again and then I'm gonna keep experimenting with that. Is it is it something that you just have to find like the right current to feed through the solution or is it like a matter of heat or, or the uh, volume of acid that's in the solution what it's a lot of different all, things. All, all of those things take take place yeah they do so it has to stay at a certain temperature to be stable um, and to plate correctly and then um, the problem with plating organic materials is that there tends to be a lot of uh, contamination in the tank um, even if you seal everything really well there's a really high chance that some of something's going to flake off and get into the tank and make it dirty and dirty solution is really hard to fix. So that's my main problem right now is trying to figure out how to stabilize it and like really get it down to a science. So if, if you're starting with an organic material and I, I, if I'm understanding you right, you're essentially priming it for the uh, electroprolating process mm -hmm. in that process, you, you, you would have to clean the organic material extremely well before you even primed it then yeah if you prime it well enough you don't have to worry too much about that but i don't know if something's really fragile um like i've plated things like moths and butterflies and cicadas in the past and um sometimes little pieces will just kind of break off and disintegrate into the tank well i mean you're working with something thinner than paper that's exactly that's insane <laughs> yeah so sometimes it can be really hard but um I don't know. The challenge is pretty fun. Well, let's let's see another piece that you got there. We'll give you a second to change to change it out. And yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, let's see some of the other works of art that you've done. Um, I know that you uh, mentioned that you also do a lot of casting. Mm -hmm. um, is 
is the casting process a lot different than the electroplating? Yeah, casting is pretty different. Um, casting, the way that I cast is through the lost wax casting method, um, which this piece that I just put down is a honeycomb belt buckle that's cast from a real honeycomb, but to give it rigidity before I cast it, I had to plate it partially so that it could be molded. So I partially electroplated it, which is one of the only pieces I've done that with to get a good mold for it. And then basically you pour wax into the mold and then you um, sprue it onto a casting tree and then you coat the casting tree in a silica slurry and then you fire it in a kiln and all the wax burns out and it fires into a ceramic shell. And then you flip that upside down and pour molten bronze into it. So that's how that process kind of works. Were you just like an ace student in science and chemistry? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're saying words I haven't even ever thought of, let alone understand. But... Did you take any jewelry classes, though? Uh, no, but I did just... work at a bronze foundry before I okay. started steel fabrication. So, so you um... have a little bit of previous experience before your your current position yes so um before i worked at steel fabrication i forgot to mention this i worked for a bronze foundry for a little over a year um so i was doing metal work there i was putting together other artists sculptures um chasing out the the seam lines to make it look like one piece um and then sending it off for patina so i learned quite a bit about the metal working part of the casting process during that time um and then i've just been trying to figure out the rest of the process on my own since then so it's kind of been a little bit of a DIY thing where you're you're really experimenting a lot. You're still learning in the process. You're probably reading a lot on your own time and, and I'm sure watching videos of other artists and, and jewelers that mm -hmm. are trying to take on similar aspects of what you're trying to achieve. But it, it doesn't seem that a lot of people are really doing this sort of organic type metal art. It, in, my, in my opinion, I've not seen it like to the extent that, that you're doing. Is it is it is it just a real niche thing? Um, not necessarily, but I feel like anybody that is in a niche can always find people to communicate with. Oh, the sure, community okay. For it, so um, I don't feel like it's particularly niche, but I definitely don't see it as often as I see like a lot of other types of jewelry, especially. Um, there's definitely a lot of people out there that make electroplated jewelry specifically. Most people work with stones. I really don't care to work with stones. I'd much rather work with organic materials, um, things that are softer, hard to cast, and things that especially have texture. That's what I'm most interested in is recreating textures um, found in nature in metal and then being able to exploit those textures with patinas. So you're almost, you're almost trying to take the what 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 would be somebody's perception of an object but bringing bringing it to life in metal form exactly yeah that's definitely what i've been trying to achieve primarily and it's definitely what i'm going to keep focusing on um as soon as i get my foundry equipment set up i'm going to try to start doing um like fabricated wood and bronze furniture and so i really want to take like um huge pieces of tree bark and things like that and cast them and then weld them together in crazy angles and make like table bases and stuff out of them that's that's insane i thanks i mean i think it's great it's it's super awesome to see that the, the kind of stuff that you're doing let's let's look at another piece that you have up there uh yeah. i think you have a few more So this this looks like it's a a replication of a morel mushroom. Is that correct? It is. Yes. What was your inspiration for trying to capture a morel? I've always wanted to capture that texture. Um, I don't necessarily have a specific motivation for it. Um, it's something that's been very difficult for me to achieve. I've tried multiple times to cast it in the past, and this is the first time it actually came out. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, my friend gave me a dehydrated morel, and then I was able to 
mold that and then I sculpted the stem out of wax um, and then patinaed it. It's It's got some in, incredible detail there. I, I mean, it it does look, to me, I, I, I love morel mushrooms. I've, I've always loved them. I go out and search for them in the spring and the fall and it's more just a pastime and of course I, I think that they taste delicious so definitely I, I really enjoy them but but looking at your art there it does look a little bit more like a dehydrated morel versus a, a live morel but you did capture the texture extremely well there thank you how, how long does that take you to make something like that um it depends on what I have going on but the process from start to finish from mold to finished prod product is for a new piece it's usually about a month but if once i have the mold made and have the piece um able to be replicated over and over again it doesn't take me very long at all to be able to create new castings of the same thing so the biggest part of the process is is creating the design the structure for what you're going to build exactly and then after you've created the mold or the the casting it's not nearly as time consuming but i mean it, it sounds like i mean a month of time is a, a long time for one piece of jewelry and even if the the subsequent uh tries or or uh products that you made after that take a lot less time it's still got to be pretty time consuming to do this kind of work it is um and I kind of love it. I love kind of just messing around with the different textures of everything and spending a lot of time on the metal finishing to try to make sure everything's smooth and comes out of the casting well. Um, the electroplating is definitely a lot more time consuming in a lot of ways and everything's a one-off. So you're making everything um, as a finished piece from start to finish every single time versus castings are kind of nice because once you make it once, you can just replicate it over and over again. So so the the castings they're essentially a mold um every one of them is very similar then yeah so once you have the mold you can re recreate the same thing over and over again you can use the same mold hundreds if not thousands of times well that that's really cool at least you know that when you do create a mold that is something like that morel you're you're able to reuse it without having to put quite as much work into it and maybe quantify the value of, of your time a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's nice to be able to get more of my work out there as well. I can put it in a bunch of different places and um, have the same casting out in four or five different shops at the same time without having to do all of the work to be able to recreate everything and then try to get a high enough price for it at retail for different shops. It's nice to be able to have something that you can recreate multiple times. Oh, I, I can only imagine, I mean, it, to spend that much time on it, I mean, you'd have to ask an a astronomical amount to be able to quantify making it on a regular basis. But with a, a cast like that, you're you're able to lower the price a lot more and to where it's uh, more affordable and appealing to the general consumer then, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, what what else do you have up there? I see there's there's a few more things. Let's Let's check some of those out. Yeah. So I used to live with a jewelry major <clears throat> when I was in my 20s, and uh, she was also from Montana, but she used to incorporate a lot of, like, nature and stuff into her jewelry. Do you think that's, like, a Montana thing or just – or for you, is it more of a texture thing? I know you talk a lot about texture in your pieces. For me, it's definitely a mixture of both. Um, I definitely have <clears throat> noticed that there are a lot of people that like to do, like – topo map pieces for jewelry and um, not necessarily castings of organic pieces like I do, but a lot of things that are inspired by it. And I think it's just kind of the passion of living somewhere in Montana or somewhere like Montana. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are drawn to the outdoors here and yeah. the mountains and they want to kind of recreate and capture that. And I think it's nice to have a respect for that. Cool. So the, this next piece that you have up, it's a it's a bracelet. Um, what what's the what's the story behind this piece? 
So um, this was actually a bracelet that my grandmother gave me, and it was um, a much thinner version in sterling silver, and she gave me this bracelet that had all of these stones that were kind of falling out of it. So I took all the stones out and then hammered all of the bezels back in and then reinforced the back side of it with wax and then cast it in bronze. Um, it's the first cuff, cuff bracelet I've made and I definitely want to keep making more things like this. But I like how all the textures turned out. I think it's really cool. Yeah, it definitely has an interesting an interesting look to it. it you can see where you've, you've smashed the bezels from the, the stone setting. Um, you mentioned working with wax a lot with, uh, with working with wax, do you have your own bees to make your wax or where, <laughs> where do you get the wax from? Um, you can use a lot of different kinds of wax, uh, use different kinds of wax for different applications. So there are like harder jewelers waxes for engraving with, um, like Dremels. And then there are like softer microcrystalline waxes that you use for, pouring and then you can use for hand sculpting um, you can sculpt a lot of pieces in wax like you would with clay um, so there are a lot of sculptors and artists that use wax instead of clay um, it's very versatile but um, they make a lot of different types of wax for jewelers specifically they make like wax tubes and wax um, like rope basically um, yeah it's kind of just the basis for the casting process that's crazy. I, you're just kind of blowing my mind right now. I don't even know what to ask because it's all new territory for me. But uh, I, I guess w where where are you where are you putting some of these pieces out at? Uh, you said there's several shops that you have pieces for sale at. Um, do you have your own store, or like an online store or something that you're pursuing, or is it just uh, at a couple shops around town? Um, so I currently have work in town at Rapscallion Gallery on the north side and then um, at Cactus Records and then I'm cool. putting work up at the Emerald Dragon Company, which is out on Sh Shepherd Trail um, this next week. And then I also have an online store. I do a lot of online sales um, and then I'm looking to expand into more stores and galleries in town and um, potentially around the state. Is it? Is it hard for you to look for different avenues to put your jewelry in uh, their stores? Or is that something that's easy? You just show them it and they, they love it right away? Or is it something that you've kind of battled trying to find avenues to uh, find people that like what you're doing? It's a bit of a battle, but I also kind of know walking into a place whether my kind of work is going to fit or not. And so I don't ask people to show my work there unless I kind of know that it's going to work. So you, you more walk into the store, feel it out, and if you get a good vibe, I guess, then, then you might talk to the manager or something about some sort of deal for, for putting your art there. Yes, primarily. And then I, I do most of my work with trying to uh, put everything online. So um, my online sales are definitely primarily how I do my business, um, especially with the aerial fabrication that I do and... Um, the jewelry and then yeah I'm looking to expand but I don't find a ton of shops in Montana that really kind of fit the feel of what I'm going for with my jewelry and I know that it won't sell in a lot of those places I'm not going to walk into like I don't know somewhere with pine cone art everywhere and <laughs> <laughs> and right. try to put my art there so um, sure. I just kind of feel it out and see what what the, like the decoration style is in the store and see if it's going to work or not. So you, you mentioned that your ambitions are, are maybe to making um, very abstract style type of furniture and almost creating a type of furniture that is a piece of jewelry. Um, is that, is that something that's very hard to, to, to get into as far as uh, the selling of this art? Because it's got to take, an astronomical amount of time to create something like that it's definitely very high-end stuff and i have no idea how i'm gonna pull it off but i'm gonna try <laughs> that's awesome that you you've got the vision i think that's that's really great um who are some of the people that have that have helped you along the way to to, to push you into this this sort of path that, that you're pursuing right now um so 
Rich, the guy from the shop that I mentioned earlier, he's been a huge source of inspiration and for me and a huge mentor for me. Um, he's an amazing artist and an amazing fabricator and just a really great person. And he's helped me a lot with a lot of my pursuits. And then um, working at the foundry was also very inspiring for me as well. And I had a lot of really good friends there. Um, and I have a really good support system at the job I have currently. They let me take on my own projects and really pursue what I want to within the field of steel fabrication, and I really appreciate that. They let me figure everything out for myself and take on the projects that I want to take on, and so that's been very helpful for me along the way. Oh, that's that's really cool that, you know, you've just been pushing through, and it really seems like it's been something that you've just wanted for a long time, and uh, maybe it started with cooking and, and sort of the fineries of, of baking and, like you said, wanting to just create something that lasted longer than something that you would just eat in a night. Um, what would you recommend f to somebody that was just starting out in the, in the art field or that was looking to try to pursue their own passion like, like you have? A lot of it is just networking and being really persistent with what you want. Um, First of all, you have to know what you want, which there are a lot of people that approach me that want to get into art or want to get into metalworking, but they have no idea what they want to pursue within the field, and it's very hard to help someone like that. Um, so knowing exactly what you want and uh, having the determination to fail repeatedly and to be turned down a lot for opportunities and to just keep pushing, um, I think that that's very important. So probably, I guess just sticking with it no matter what knowing who you are what your what your passion and desire is and not letting not letting yourself get discouraged by uh all the obstacles that uh, inevitably come come upon you exactly and it's also very helpful to just find a community of people that have the same passions as you and um everybody kind of helps each other out that's that's awesome that's just really cool seeing some of the stuff you've got there i think there's one or two more pieces is there or, or have we made it through all the ones you have up there uh i have a wishbone i could show really quick yeah let's let's check out the wishbone so this this wishbone is st silver yeah it's cast in sterling silver and is that process different sort of casting or is it just heat it to the right temperature and pour it in the mold um no that's not quite how it works it's um a centrifugal casting system so the way that you would pour like a bronze sculpture is different from the way that you would pour um jewelry especially jewelry that has a lot of openings or um a lot of like appendages i guess so something like a wishbone you need to either vacuum cast or centrifugal cast um so that piece was done with centrifugal casting. So you basically uh, use a wax injector to inject the wax into the mold because it won't pour like it is right now. And then after you have it injected, um, you take your wax, sprue it on your tiny little casting tree, and then um, you use a centrifugal caster that basically just spins the object in a big circle um, over and over again. And it kind of gets all of the metal to where it needs to go. And you're doing this while it's under vacuum, or is that a separate process? Did I misunderstand? The vacuum that? casting is a separate process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in in the vacuum process, you'd actually have to have a whole separate change chamber and do the centrifugal, or is it entirely no, it, separate? The vacuum is separate. So um, the vacuum casting and centrifugal casting are two different types of jewelry casting, but they're both for jewelry. Um, the vacuum casting you. Take your, your wax tree, um, and then you... I haven't done vacuum casting, but the way that I understand it is you put it into the vacuum chamber, and then you use a machine that just kind of does it for you. It's very strange. You press a button, and it creates the vacuum chamber, and then it just sucks the metal where it needs to go. That's... I, I don't know. My mind is blown right now. I, I don't understand <laughs> that part either, but... <laughs> I think it just kind of sucks the air out and it just kind of makes the metal fill the mold. Fill the yeah, void there. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's way cool. Yeah. Well, 
yeah, this has been awesome having you on, on our show here. And, uh, again, uh, I've been wanting, I personally have been wanting to get you on this show for a long time. I'm glad that we've waited till we had video and we could actually see it and, and, uh, everybody else can see some of your, your art. It's, it's incredible. I didn't know that there was nearly as much process to it as you've just explained to us. And, um, again, I appreciate you coming out here and, and taking the time to, to talk to everybody and us about what you do. It's, it's, uh, truly truly awesome work thank you that's very sweet i really appreciate you reaching out yeah and uh again to all you guys watching the show out there if you've got something cool uh that's art related at all hit us up and we'll, we'll uh, get you on the show and we'll talk about what you do because um it's it's incredible all of the the facets that the gallatin valley has to offer with artists and musicians and poets and comedians and uh we want to capture you all so um, definitely hit us up. And uh, don't forget to uh, check out Periphery Metal Arts, Metalworks. Metalworks. Sorry. Metalworks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, check out Taylor's pieces. Thank it's you guys stuff. so much. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> and everybody, know your scene.